you can take part in the final round table where all the speakers will be present and available for answers. And so, I will also answer now in the, in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Martin. And I leave the stage to my colleague, Dr. Antilio Zilli, who is presenting next speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And um, so for those who joined now, I'm uh, Tilio Zilli, calling from Politecnico di Milano. And I'm um, very excited to be co-chairing this session of the FNIP, FNIP network. And the next speaker of this uh, morning is Humei Rakaglayan. She's an associate professor of physics in the Faculty of uh, Engineering and Natural Sciences in, the, in Finland, Tampere University. And she made a, a, an intercontinental journey to get there. So she had first her PhD in Turkey, Bilkent University in 2010. And then she moved to work with another Engeta's group in Pennsylvania University. So she's always been working in um, metamaterials and plasmonics. And now she moved with a, an ERC starting grant uh, in Finland, where she started her group on metaplasmonics. This morning, uh, she will be talking about rolled up multi-layer nanostructures and their applications. So we look forward to hear from her. Thank you very much. And please, Humeira, the stage is yours. Yeah. Um, I do hope that you see the correct screen that I cannot be sure, but I do hope that it's, it's the full screen. Um, is it correct? Attila, is it correct screen or do you see the full screen? I can see your uh, presentation, no. the first okay, slide. Great. Looks good. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. I think it's been, it's really nice to, to able to present some of our recent work here. Uh, very, very exciting set of speakers. And I think also you started a really nice webinars here. Um, just uh, just for me today, I will talk about these uh, rolled up multi-layer nanostructures and, and some of their applications. Um, so I'm from Tampere University and just to let you know where I'm sitting right now, uh, I, we are in Finland and we are in a little bit further north from Helsinki and um, let me get my laser here. Uh, So we are here and we are in this campus and I'm sitting somewhere somewhere here right now. So you can imagine where I am. Um, and this is our lab where, where the fun happens actually through the other slides that I'm gonna show you. Um, with that too, I would right away start with some introduction uh, about multi-layer, uh, but planar metamaterials. Um, in my group, as the group name also comes uh, as meta metaplasmonics, we are interested on metamaterials and, and some plasmonic devices and structures. Um, and in that, uh, we are quite interested to, to look for different kind of metamaterials. And usually uh, this is more um, normal approach that, that we obtain. And many have been studied on this actually using multi-layer planar structures. What I mean with that is that you bring different kind of um, metals and dielectrics like Oliver Martin very well uh, explained. So you can bring those kind of hybrid structures and you can achieve even what you cannot already achieve with normally available natural materials. So this is one way of obtaining it. So if you would stack, for example, in this case, a gold and titanium dioxide and with a plasmonic and a dielectric, then you can manipulate its properties. So then when it interacts with the light, so um, you can control this interaction at your will, depending on how you structure this, um, this sample over here. So this is a, this is a top, top down uh, approach in a way. So you will bring everything from uh, each, by, each each step separately. 
Um, this is this is I think okay, but if you want to really make uh, some other things, like if you want to even further manipulate the light and add, add some nanostructures on this kind of metal dielectrics, then um, then you want to make sure first of all that each layer of the position that you do both the metal and dielectric would have the same quality uh, as you want, and then later on when you do the nanostructure that everything would be under control. So this might, this might be, um, first of all, from the fabrication point of view, requires a lot of um, challenges to, to, to overcome a lot of challenges. <clears throat> but let's move on. Um, I think one particular metamaterial that we are interested in is Epsilon New Zealand metamaterials. And these metamaterials, Actually, you can you can find also some of them in nature. Like you can find a material that is occurring in nature that is usually in the near infrared region, such as transparent conductive oxides like an indium tin oxide or aluminium doped zinc oxide. If you look at the permittivity value of such kind of materials, um, so you can see that at some point they are zero. Um, these are, this is one example from Purdue group that they have this aluminum doped zinc oxide. And then you can clearly see that in the near infrared range, this is, this is a zero uh, crossing. There are other materials. This is, this is ITO that we have used. It has also crossing around 1.24 and there are other materials such as silicon carbide, carbide or others. I think aluminum garmarsenide and others that are working in near infrared or far infrared. Actually, if you really think about metals as well, they have such certain of crossing of uh, zero in the UV region, uh, but also in that region, they might have a high imaginary part, which may not so useful. But nevertheless, as you can see, there is also a gap that you may not find these materials easily in the visible region. And that is, that is kind of the, where this focus of multi-layer structures has been mostly started. If you, if you would stack those metals and dielectrics and from the material dispersion, um, if you bring those permittivity values under your control and you can create a near zero uh, dispersion, near zero permittivity value for such uh, effective material. So you create a hybrid material and it effectively works as epsilon near zero metamaterial. This is so-called uh, by, by making this material dispersion engineering. And there is another aspect to this actually, which is not so common, is uh, structural dispersion. And this structural dispersion is uh, completely from a different aspect. Uh, it's, it's using a waveguide. If you would have a waveguide structure, and if you operate your waveguide, at, it is a cutoff of it is fundamental mode. So if you have a, a mode that is propagating inside this waveguide, and if you operate close to the cutoff of this mode, then you will get also a effective uh, epsilon zero medium of because that mode actually has an index zero. And that is so-called structural dispersion. And um, this has been shown um, using such kind of a rectangular plasmonic waveguide, which requires, um, again, quite many uh, fabrication steps. Um, and then you can, you, can, you can get, after many challenges, you can get one such structure. And then it's been shown that it actually really works as an ENZ medium. Sorry that I forget to put the citation. It's uh, it's from uh, Engetas. Uh, it's from Engeta and, and I'm also one of the coders. It was published in PRF. Um, and then um, this is one way. This is again, uh, if we go back to the other one, which is more straightforward, is the material dispersion. So what has been done from this one is more uh, maybe related in the, the for the beginning of my talk as well. So uh, we have these metals and dielectrics in such case, as I said, this is 
for example, titanium dioxide and gold, and then you can actually quite nicely measure and characterize uh, the structure. And this has a, this quite nicely fits uh, the calculations as well. Then you can, what you can do, you can manipulate this, for example, near zero wavelength by changing the thickness of gold, thickness of dielectric or gold as well. In this case, we have looked into two cases. One is the um, case that we have been aiming for epsilon near zero around um, 600 and the other was around five, 700. So this just works as stacking metals and dielectrics. Um, but we have observed that we have two different hyperbolic so-called metamaterials and we can get the epsilon near zero for both of them. These are, I mean, if you would ask that, how we can make sure that actually these are really, um, because this is basically the permittivity is like a calculation of averaging out these metal and dielectric permittivity values. Um, but there's, there's actually one, one uh, way also to extract the, these permittivity values from the measured data. These uh, measurements we can do is, um, we can measure both the reflection and then the transmission. And then by reverse calculation, you can extract the permittivity value as well. And then it fits quite nicely. In this case, we have changed the, actually this is not exactly the same dimensions as I showed in here. This was around six, 680 nanometer. In this one, we changed the gold and titanium dioxide a little bit. Now uh, we even shifted it to 600 nanometers. So this, this is uh, the uh, calculation that is extracted from the reflection and transmission data. So these, I think so far very well understood and invest, um, like investigated by many others as well, um, using different materials in different part of the light, uh, light favorite spectrum they have been investigated. Um, I will go to the main topic after today, but I would like to give one, one last example of this. Actually, you can even enhance these. Um, what I mean enhance is with all the optimizations that you might able to do, you can, you can make this so-called enhanced EMZ feature of such material. In this case, for example, we even used um, indium tinoxide as the metal plasmonic structure and a dielectric. And we have shown um, that you can use it as a coherence switching in a laser, instead of just using uh, um, mirrors in a laser uh, medium, you can change it to a so-called enhanced ENZ mirror. And then you, you are able to get coherence switching with such materials. I think this is one nice example that, uh, that these multi-layer stack structures can be used towards, towards the technology. But uh, these are all nice, uh, but again, I, I hear quotes all over here. I think maybe not, not all fits to all these nanotechnology, not all the fabrication techniques fit all. So in that sense, we, we want to look from a different approach to obtaining these metamaterials. Uh, therefore, uh, this brings me to, to today's uh, topic, this rolled up metamaterials that we are interested. And I would like to go through, first of all, how we get, uh, how we fabricate those, how we uh, use tin films and then obtain these 3D, 3D structures and then 3D rolled up materials. Then I will move into the metal surface applications uh, these are basically in this first part, especially here. It very much depends on the material dispersion to obtain a metamaterial, depends on the metamaterial material engineering. In this part, it is mostly depending on the structural dispersion engineering. And I will talk about how we can use these st uh, structures, rolled up mater metamaterials as index zero waveguide for further applications. 
let let me uh, let me start explaining how this really all works. So this self-roving technique um, has been first discovered by Prince and colleagues in uh, about twenty years ago. They have used uh, materials that have been uh, grown using the molecular beam epitaxy technique, MBE technique. And then they were focused on using gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide materials. Um, and then it, um, then they, they mostly it's been focused over the years on that kind of materials. These kind of materials are, are nice. And of course you can, you can use them. But um, of course, one, one know is that to obtain metamaterials such as I showed you would require uh, different materials and different dielectrics. And then to go forward to that, actually that requires another, um, another approach to this self-building technique. And that is what we have developed so far. Um, this is, the, this is the, the schematics of such structure. And the advantage, advantages of this self-rolling technique is that in terms of cost, speed, and I think I would say parallel fabrication of many of the samples at once. Uh, these, are the, these are the advantages of using it. Instead of putting each layer and make sure that each layer will have the same quality and, and properties that you, that you will, um, you can make sure that in, that you can get, get rid of those kind of issues in, in this approach. So what we have in, in, our, in our fabrication technique, we have um, a germanium layer. And then on top of that layer in, in this study, especially we use germanium, but it can be as well a resist, like a microtography resist, like an SEU8. And then we had a dielectric and a, a metal layer. And then while we etch this, uh, this uh, sacrificial layer, then we could obtain these self-rolling structures. These are because of the strain in the silicon dioxide layer and a gold layer. Um, and when we, when we remove this bottom germanium layer, it, it, it then effect it then starts rolling on itself to create such structure. What is important here is that um, you have to make sure that there's enough strain between these two layers, silicon dioxide and gold in this case, and then you can access to the sacrificial layer to etch it. Uh, these are some of the important issues here. On the other hand, it's really nice that because you can, based on the thickness of the silicon dioxide and gold, you can control the diameter so that how much they will form in the diameter. And then depending on the pattern you defined here, you can control the length. Length can be quite, quite big. Of course, it has a limitation because after some, after some length, I think it, it may not roll as properly, or it may, it may crack. Um, but let me also show you this video, which might be a better way uh, to explain this whole process. So we first put the germanium layer and then the silicon dioxide and gold. And then once we etch it, actually we can, we can have this system, the self-rolling system. Um, of course, it's possible to use um, different uh, metal and dielectric layers here. We optimize this system for silicon dioxide and gold so far, but it's possible to use only dielectric as well. And only, only metal is also possible, which we, we, which we haven't obtained yet. So uh, the easiest is that to use either a resist or germanium as a sacrificial layer. Uh, resist is uh, resist and germanium although they may um, both work as a sacrificial layer, they act a little bit differently. Therefore, either you have the same silicon dioxide and gold layers, you might end up with different diameter values when you use a different sacrificial layer as well. So these are all some components to consider. And 
after all these schematics and, and descriptions, I would like to also show you one video um, how we obtain these structures. Oh, didn't start. No. Sorry. Uh, oh. Okay. In this video, you see this, first of all, let me explain. These are all patterned regions where we patterned uh, and we have germanium layer, silicon dioxide and gold layer. And then later on, uh, this shows the last step where we actually uh, etch the germanium layer because it's, it, it's a wet etch. Actually, it might blur a little bit at some time, but let's see. Actually, this is this is real time, but I, I'll stop here uh, because I like this end end of here. Actually, they if you wait a little bit a little bit more, a couple of seconds more, they will all roll themselves. But I wanted to here show you that. See how this is like uh, this is expand to do the strain and getting getting ready to to roll. Um, maybe I'll, I'll show you here a little bit once more. It's it's really nice. It's it fo it loses the focus at some point because it's in in the the cut. But you can see that they are they are all rolling, and um, this is this is how it works in the reality. And you can you can of course see more videos and such in this in this web page. So what we have done is actually we, we were looking and then what kind of combinations would be work the best and what, what should be looking for. And this is, uh, this is a calculation to, if you use different thicknesses and different, different thicknesses of gold and silicon dioxide, you may get different thickness, um, with different diameters. So we had a range of then these values and this is what we have obtained. These greens are five microns and the reds are 10 microns. So we could get a quite different range. We specifically choose these cubes here uh, because this is, these are the best one that are showing. Actually, they are more tightly and, and better actually, but these are to show you how they uh, really have the layers. And then it is possible then what we have done usually in a planar case, it is possible to do the calculations also to similar to um, to, for these kind of materials. Um, what we have done in this case, because as you see here, we have these layers, which we had initially planar, and we know the thickness and each, each layer. So we can assume in a way that they are forming this kind of a cylindrical um, structure. And then we were, uh, initially we decided to use this just, uh, just we did is in the planar case, just making an average of these layers. But um, in such kind of a structure, it is important also to take into account the circular dimensions and circularity. So that's why although planar approach might work, I think the, the, the best is to use the circular approach here. So we developed a, a method that we can identify the permittivity in the circular um, like circular coordinates. And when you look at the, the circular coordinates, so there's some, some, some nice um, outcomes here. So each of these lines actually corresponds one of these on the table. And uh, the ones in the parentheses shows us um, actually the, um, the number, of, uh, number of rows that we have defined for these uh, tubes. So in the calculations, we took care of everything. We took care of diameter, the thickness of the layers, and also the number, how many numbers that we had in the tube, in the, in the rolls of walls. Um, of course, uh, from one approach that it's good to have different diameters. And even though you, you, you can, by changing the ratio, you can get different diameters. So from here, we change it from one over four ratio to four. And then, and in this case, we have looked into more different um, dimensions. And here, this is the reflection uh, measurement and the simulation, which is quite in agreement that shows 
how these uh, tubes actually work. And if you would look at this, each of these tubes would cross at a would, would cross the zero at a different wavelength, slightly different wavelength. And then this also reflects on the reflection spectrum, how this, this is effective. Um, so this, this shows actually that they're really nicely you can get a rolled up 3D metamaterials uh, by just using a planar structure and then letting it for the self-rolling. It's really nice to have these structures. And as I showed you, we can have many at one sample. So there's a lot of room to, to, to do more. That's why that's what we did. We took into account this and we take one of them and we did and some further nanostructuring on top. Let me show you a more focused one. So in each of these rectangular regions here, we have this kind of structure on top of the tube. And um, we, can, we can manipulate them differently. So if you would take a tube, this is the SCN image, this is the optical, mic optical microscope image. And if you look at this one, you can manipulate each of these nanostructures differently but each of them is actually has the same layers here. Um, first of all, we have done each of these squares, uh, which, has been, which has been then um, done by the focus ion beam on top of this tube with different uh, diameter, with, I'm sorry, with different lengths of each square. So each, all the squares in this region has this one, and then we, we change them towards a lower one. Um, I don't want to get a lot of on the detail of the calculations of how we did actually um, those, uh, like, uh, but I will be happy to answer some questions um, about this later on. Um, so if you would look at each of, if you, if you can measure each of these structures, they behave differently. And this shows in the reflection as well. Um, this is the simulation and then this is the reflection the, in the experimental, this is the measured one. So we can see that as we change the, uh, the as we change the dimension, we can see this on the reflection. So that then this brings a really, really nice uh, idea. So um, of course, the, the, like, like Oliver mentioned that if you would have different dimensions and different size, and if you would put them correctly, you can create a meta surface. Um, we, we had a similar idea. We didn't really focus on optimizing the system for, for a 2 pi phase or such, um, such a perfect uh, phase distribution, but we just go ahead with the same structures that we had and bring them together instead. So right now, instead of having them on differently, now we bring them together as, as one unit cell and we keep one of the dimension fixed and change the other one uh, as I showed in the previous slides. So here it, it's, it's a little bit looking like this, actually, little, if you look really closely, what's happening on the surface of these tubes is that we have those metals and dielectrics, and we are basically changing this length of these holes, squares. And then we, that's why we are expecting when we send this, when, because we are changing this uh, day front, of the light, because each of them will have a different phase response, uh, then, then you will have a different uh, transmission. On the transmission wavefront, you will see an effect of this. Before I show you that, I would like to first share uh, some little bit more SEM images on this structure. So this is again, this optical microscope image, and then we have, uh, we have this this area, as you see here, we have changed the dimension of each of these slightly. And then um, we, we can see that each of them has the same layer. Um, one good question is that actually, when we try to make this uh, structure on top, it also, it also appears on the tier. So it's, it's there. Um, this is the face that is. Uh, in a planar case and in a curved case, actually, it has a slight effect. But when you arrange them really nicely, then you can see this how this is really working. And you can you can also find some more detail on this uh, on this publication 
over here. So they are on the website, I think, of this uh, webinar announcement. So I'm not gonna go to there. So let's check it out. And then this brings me to, to the second part. Uh, so, so far at, that I talked, we were looking for the material dispersion. So when we look at these layers, what we have been looking is at what, how to change these layers so we would get the, uh, the, the, the material, effective material that are working in this kind of system. In this, in the second part, I would like to talk a little bit on the, uh, on the structure dispersion. This rolled up tubes, uh, although we have been looking to the walls so far. They can... Yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Before uh, you start a new topic, I just wanted to give you a it's... heads up that we have not much time left. Yeah, I, so... I just have a couple of slides here. Okay, not it's much. all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. wanted to... Yeah, yeah. For, this is, this is not much, this part. Don't Thank worry. <laughs> yeah. So in this part, we just modulate the, the mode. And then when we change the, this dimensions, actually, we can see that it works as a, as in the beginning, as I showed, it can work as also index wave, zero index waveguide mode. Uh, oops, sorry, slide is not changing. Yep, here we go. And and we have actually have done the same as a as a rectangular waveguide. You can, con you can consider this as a circular waveguide and it's possible to see the effect of this. So one good example to look for this is the quantum paramana, but I think this is again too much for you. So I just jump into this one and, and finish here. So if you look at it, some, some dipoles here in such a system, you can see a quite a difference effect when they are in the zero index waveguide. And uh, you can manipulate the interaction of these in, in such kind of a medium much better than you do in a homogeneous medium. So it, it can have some further applications in this direction. And this is, this is the conclusion that I want to say. I think I, I explained to you this with the materials and metal surfaces, but it can also go through this waveguide mode and quantum applications, which is, which is also quite interesting. Then this is the this is the final slide. I would like to thank to the to my team, um, and then I would like to thank to the, also the funding agencies. Thank you, and I will be happy to get some questions. And I think I, you would read it. Yeah. Good. So thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, I, <laughs> I didn't want to mean it that fast, but <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, so we have a first question uh, from Mariano Barella, which is actually quite interesting. So how do you control the rolling up direction? Because actually we see that in the images, all the cubes roll up in the same direction. So is this a, yeah. an anisotropic catching, how it's controlled? Mm -hmm. Let me go back to there so I can explain better. Um, maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, maybe both of these are good. Um, maybe this one. So here, as you see, um, these are actually, um, if you look closely here, this is not a perfect square patch. Like here, we defined the area where we would like the rolling happening. And this, this, this area that we see, this small, Small parts are so-called anchors that where we actually anchor the rolled up tube. And this part is the rec kind of rectangles uh, where you can then identify the rolling direction. In this part where you start this um, here, we have a little bit of shift in the, as you see, there's an opening here. This is defined by the microtography step which I didn't get into that. And this, in this part, because here you don't have an access to the germanium layer, but here you have an access to the germanium layer. Therefore, it starts to etching here. And then therefore it decides to go in this direction. But also it, it can be affected from the, the patch, how you do it. In this patch, we defined it as a rectangle. So, and then there is this, as you see, there's a darker part here, which is the, 
which is the where you access to the germanium layer. So it goes to this direction. But you can make a different kind of patch instead of a, this kind of rectangle, and you can change the rolling direction. Instead of it can go like this, it can also go like this in the backward direction as well. Um, it very much depends on these lithography steps that you define. Thank you. And um, there is also another question on the fabrication. Um, so he, C3N Go, he, they say the preparation of the multi-layer is very interesting, I agree. And it seems to be very small in dimension, which I think it's diameter. So uh, what is in the reflectance transmission measurement? What is the size of the light beam? And how did you focus it on the tube? Yeah. So how did you measure the single tube reflectance um, that you have shown? Nice question. Oh, but I'm going to do one question. Um, let me get to the reflection measurements to explain to you. Yep. So actually, like here, this is the this is the tube, and in this direction, in the length of the tube, it is um, it, it's quite long. It it can be um, it can actually go to defining the patch. This can go to fifty microns as well. In our case, we mostly limit them to um, thirty microns region. But if you send the beam towards this direction. And in our case, as you see, our structures are, are like this. So this is like an eight micron, and this is like a, a 12 micron, 15 micron. So the beam size in our case, in our measurement, we use a confocal uh, microscopy setup with a 100x objective. And the beam size is around 1.2 micron, 1.2 to 1.5. So it's like something like we cover uh, quite, a, quite a small range. Here. Of course, in this case, I think um, th this is important that how much is the diameter of the tube. And that's why here you see the measurements start from the rolled up tubes with a diameter of two micron. And then although we have other, other tubes which has smaller diameter like this or this, which um, we which, which can give you some reflection, but I think they were not so trustable. So we only measured those ones, which starts from the two micron range. And, and even 1.5, we can measure, but we didn't wanna really put it here. Um, for the other case, actually, this is a really good point that I may maybe elaborate. In this case of the structural dispersion though, you might like to have smaller diameters, therefore, the diameters that we couldn't measure the reflection for the material dispersion actually is really nice to use it as this kind of a waveguide mode case. So these are these are two different aspects and two different dimensions that you can use. Thank you. Um, so I think now it's time to move on to the next speaker, but uh, if you can kindly uh, look at the Q&A, and there are a few more questions on the fabrications, so um, I think you, <laughs> yeah, and then we'll see again each other at the final session. So I will now give the word again to Gianluca, who will introduce the last speaker of the session. Thank you very much again, and uh, speak soon. Okay, thank you, Attilio. So the last speaker is Patrice Genevieve.